Hello again. Now you remember that in the first video when we looked at the question about what is strategy, we saw that the process by which strategy was developed and updated is critical. It's in the process that the synthesis of the insight from the tools and frameworks we use comes together is combined with managers experience and tacit know-how to lead to decision making and action. But what happens in that black box that is the strategy development process? Well, when you ask most managers about how strategy should be developed, they talk about a very linear and deliberate process. You gather views about the external and internal environment. You look at what stakeholders' imperatives are. And from that, you build a strategic analysis that makes predictions about the future and provides understanding of the present. That analysis will feed strategic choice where options are identified and a selection is made. That choice then feeds into objectives and targets for the organisation, which is passed to the business to be implemented. And with that implementation comes resource allocation and organisational design. It's fed into business plans and budgets and into individual targets and incentive schemes. You'll then put in place some form of formal control that feeds back in terms of what the results of the implementation are. And you'll see this view about how strategy is made reflected in many of the popular management books you might see at airports and elsewhere. For example, this book by Lafley and Martin. Lafley was the former chairman and chief executive of Procter & Gamble. And he tells the story of the regeneration of Ole through a very rational, deliberate process. However, that process doesn't seem to match the uncertainty and complexity of the environment in which firms and managers operate or how humans behave and think. Indeed, if you ask managers about how strategy works in their organisation, they'll say it is nothing like that, usually saying that their firm is therefore not very good at strategy. The research of practice of strategy shows that strategic decisions do not take place in distinct linear steps. It's a very constricted process where information gathering is limited and time constrained. It's a very fluid process. Yes, there are formal parts to it, strategy away days and board meetings, but it's complemented by informal interaction, corridor conversations, it's responses to events in the marketplace or internally, maybe having to present the strategy to a shareholders meeting. And within that, there is a lot of intuition and creativity going on, as well as that analysis that the strategy tools provide. The process is also sporadic. It doesn't take place in a single burst. It will be constantly interrupted by other priorities and an executive team cycling around a decision point several times. And therefore, the role of leadership in the strategy process is critical to ensure that momentum is not lost and decisions are taking place at a suitable time. Now, the literature on strategy process lays out a spectrum of views on how strategy is decided. At one end of that spectrum, is that very deliberate planning model of strategy. But other theorists talk about a much more adaptive and emergent process. 
Some say that strategy is really just the pattern of autonomous day-to-day -day interaction of people in the organization in responding to the market. So there's no overarching explicit direction being set. The very turbulence and uncertainty mean that predictions are impossible. Therefore, rationally deciding the future of the organization is folly. As extreme ends of this literature, there is a Darwinian view that you either evolve or die. Natural selection in the marketplace will mean that firms will die and their resources will be released and invested elsewhere in firms that better fit the environment that has emerged. A little less extreme view points to chaos theory and the idea that order emerges if you put in place just a few simple rules and boundaries within which the firm operates. And we can see this playing out in famous decisions. Pfizer launching Viagra. And what about PayPal's origins? Listen to this. Say so in at least a couple of ways. I kind of started this with the belief that maybe coming out of the corporate world as I did, that you could figure out a corporate strategy, kind of like a general, figuring out a battle plan in advance and then go to battle with that battle plan. And what I've come to learn is the power of emergent strategy, where it is, at least in the worlds in which we live, with the amount of change going on, it's a self-conceit to think you can figure out in advance and tell everyone in your company what to do. Instead, you need to build an environment where the customers, where your users, where your employees are figuring out what the business should be. Um, and that's very different than the way I had started. It, it's a much more open and porous view of the world where the right answers will emerge from the community. Uh, you know, there's an eBay example of this in the history of PayPal. PayPal was started by you know, a brilliant team of inventors whose vision was PDA to PDA money transfer. Well, you could, you know, just like you can beam a business card between palm devices, you can beam with their initial invention money. So they launched that, and nothing happened. Um, no demand. So then, as they were sitting there, kind of saying, hmm, not many customers, somebody said, well, let's put this on the web. So they put up some website where you could do that, and nothing happened. And then a few months later, Somebody, um, one of their very few users, emailed them saying, we'd like permission to use the PayPal logo on an eBay auction. And this was debated within the PayPal team about whether they should do this or not, because it wasn't their strategy. And I know this because I, at the time of the combination of PayPal and eBay, I talked to some of the executives and talked to one of the PayPal execs who was on the con side, saying, no, we shouldn't let PayPal be used on eBay auctions. Well, you know what happened, of course, they relented, they allowed it, and boom, that's what made PayPal huge and earth-changing, world-changing. It's an example of emergent strategy. So PayPal's success was not based on a deliberate strategy. It was down to luck and circumstances. But whilst that may work in some situations, an entirely adaptive and emergent view means the organization lacks cohesion and is unable to bring to bear its resources and capabilities to succeed. You can think about the two ends of the spectrum between deliberate rational views and this adaptive emergent views in the same way of states of matter. At the rational deliberate end, think about a solid, a metal, where all the molecules are tightly bound together and ordered, strictly in place and doing what they're supposed to do. Great for control, but very little innovation and ability to cope with change. However, at the other end of the spectrum, if you think about a gas, all the molecules are going in all directions. It is chaos and the full weight is not brought to bear in any one direction. Perhaps a better view, therefore, is to look more in the middle of this spectrum. And here a more learning view does exist. And this view says that, yes, there is an intended rational strategy that organisations developed. And when that strategy is enacted, 
some of the, that intention will come off. So some aspects of the strategy you see firms following is deliberate, but other aspects of that strategy won't work. Maybe a competitor responds in a certain way. Maybe there was a misreading of the marketplace or customers' needs have changed. However, at the same time, bubbling up from the day-to-day -day decisions that individuals and teams make inside the organisation is an emergent strategy. And that comes together with the deliberate elements of the strategy to create the realised strategy of the organisation. So strategy, under this view, is a complex process involving a mix of deliberate and emergent thinking. Now proponents of this view, like Henry Mintzberg, therefore say that strategy process is all about synthesising the range of learning that is received from many sources into the vision and the direction that the business should pursue. For when you look inside what happens in an organisation, you'll see a very complex process of lots of events and engagement with decision makings through workshops, away days, deep dives, project teams into particular aspects of the strategy or understanding the marketplace, discussions in one-to-ones between executives and senior teams, daily interaction in operational meetings, perhaps spurred by having to do a board presentation to explain the firm's results or gain further investment from shareholders, and also in the development of individuals and that senior team. So the activities linked to strategy may seem to be sporadic and chaotic and often seen as unstructured. But through this, learning is being gained, a better understanding of what's required and of the way in which the firm needs to respond. So that chaos leads to order. We can think about this in terms of strategic themes that emerge. That includes commitment to major programmes. Also translating that emerging strategy down into the business units of the firm. But also a continuous refinement. So the strategy process is this ongoing process of learning that's constantly seeking clarity and gaining commitment for actions so that momentum can be built. Within this, both deliberate and emergent elements of strategy are part of that learning process, including the annual strategic plan process that most organisations go through. This is the standard process for Aviva. Start in February, March each year in setting overall objectives for the group. Those are passed down to the business units who to develop business and financial plans to meet those objectives. And then there are rounds of iterations as managers agree to the specific targets for their businesses. And that is built into personal objectives and incentives. You'll also see the overall direction of the organisation, its vision and strategy, being pushed down into business balance scorecards to ensure that the organisation is not just focused on to achieving its financial objectives, so it is focused on to the wider delivery of its strategy. And so as well as looking at the return the organisation is making to shareholders, also looking at the customer perspective on the business, the internal business processes and what the firm must excel at to succeed with its strategy, and also how it is continuing to improve and create value into the future. And in each of those areas, you're setting objectives, choosing indicative measures to show you're meeting those objectives, and then setting numerical targets to show your progress 
against meeting those objectives. So if you like, there's stars to steer by as the organisation journeys into the future towards its vision. So strategy process therefore is many things. Yes, there are elements of planning, but it is much about a learning process and storytelling, telling a narrative to key stakeholders to ensure they continue to support the firm. So in practice, you have to think about process as being this hybrid of a deliberate and an emergent approach where managers will emphasise different aspects at different times. But at its heart, there is a core learning process through which the firm responds and influences its environment and also galvanises action in the firm towards an agreed future. And in that learning process, the strategy theory and frameworks that we cover on the module are important inputs into that process. They inject new insights that help ensure more robust decisions are being made. So we can come back to that question about what is strategy. And in my view, it's about how an organisation comes to a shared view about what it wants to be in the future and then makes it happen. And that reinforces that strategy is about looking at the whole organisation, not just the parts. It's about that intersection between the organisation and its environment and it encompasses its responsibilities to society. And behind all that is the practical application of theory to make better decisions. Thank you for listening.